Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. Today, we are going to discuss living pathways, but not the benefits. Well, not really. I wanna discuss the key challenges that maintaining living pathways has presented on our farm. Uh, I'm a firm believer that you should always be critical of your systems. Uh, I don't know where they need improvement and what you would do differently in setting them up if you could. So beyond a little update at the end on my chamomile pathways, that's what today's video is going to be the downsides and challenges of my living pathways. Because the other thing I'm a firm believer in, transparency, also ghosts. So let's do it. First things first, if you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. If you are subscribed, well, you're awesome. And if you gain something from this video or any of our videos, you can always support our work at patreon.com slash no-till growers. Okay, I guess we should cover some basics here real quick. I don't know if there is a clear definition of what constitutes a living pathway out there because it could be a lot of things. But on our farm, when I say living pathway, what I am referring to is perennial grasses and legumes, uh, some that I sowed, some that nature chose, that live permanently between our growing beds. We don't ever grow in these pathways. They're just permanently pathways. The pathways or walkways or whatever you would like to call them are 18 inches wide and 50 feet long. Uh, I manage them with an electric mower and I keep them out of from creeping into our beds with an edger. So that's the basics. Uh, before I get into the critical side of this video though, I'm going to do a little compliment sandwich here uh, to kick it off, you know, in case my living pathways happen to be watching, which stranger things have happened. Oh, stranger things haven't happened. That's a great show, by the way. So first, the things I like. Well, ultimately, the reason I chose living pathways on the new farm was twofold. I'd had good experiences with living pathway trials on my last farm. And then second, we have a lot of slope here on this new farm. And so if I put in wood chips into the pathways, they simply wash out. Now to be clear, I love wood chips. I, I would happily put wood chips everywhere and we finally have a decent wood chip hookup, but it's a futile effort on this farm, on these slopes. Uh, we are semi-subtropical, Kentucky 6B, and the rainfall is no joke. We get these heavy downpours and if the wood chips are on sloped path at all, and sometimes even when they are not on any sort of slope, they wash out or they wash over top of the beds. Um, remember wood floats, which is not great in a rainy environment uh, with dense soils like we have here. Straw and hay work fairly well, but they introduce weed seeds to the growing beds. So that's a little complicated. So effectively, the alternative is leaving the paths in just bare soil, which is both ugly and creates a lot of erosion. So after much trial and error, and many discussions with people like my buddy, Jenny Love of Love and Fresh Flowers. You can listen to that up here. What we ultimately landed on for our farm was living pathways, a sort of small scale version of strip tillage, or I guess strip no tillage as it were. Uh, living pathways are not something I see a lot and they are definitely emphatically not something I'm going to just recommend to any and every farm. It may truly not make sense in your context. I don't think people always hear me when I say that. So really put some thought into how you're going to manage your gardens before you establish living pathways um, or something like living pathways. They are not without their complications. So that's kind of the intention of this video. I cover more about context and general management in this video. So if this is of interest, make sure to watch that. Generally, what I will say though, is that I do love them. My whole family loves the living pathways. They are beautiful. They are fun to work in, soft. It feels like gardening in a park. Uh, the management is a bit less than bear paths as well. They don't erode or wash out, but it's time to get into the critical meat of our compliment sandwich here because like all systems, living pathways have their pros and cons. First, let's talk about right now. It's spring and we are still having a step on our carrots a little bit. We are still having to cover a few things to protect them from frost while also having to occasionally irrigate because it's also been in the 70s and 80s for the last few days. Gotta love it. So anytime we want to mow the paths right now, we have to not only remove the row cover as you would if you were cultivating paths with a hoe, um, but the difference is that we also have to remove the weights, anything holding down the fabric because we can't mow over them. 
we also have to move the irrigation line completely onto the bed as well just to get it out of the way of the mower. Um, how that's different from when we're cultivating paths by hand is that you can usually, you know, just cultivate around anything in the pathway or move it as you go. But when we, a mower is involved, you have to entirely move it out of the way. And it will be like that all season because the row cover may be put up, but the shade cloth will come out. So that's a challenge. I think the simple answer would be to just ha not have those obstacles in the paths at all. Um, so perhaps I could move my irrigation lines to the center of the beds or bury them or even raise them up on a line of some sort. I do think there is a solution for the irrigation somewhere. The row cover though is a little more complicated. I can't simply cover my whole farm in tunnels to decrease the need for row cover. I can't afford to and I enjoy working out in the open field, etc. Anyway, moving stuff out of the paths is an issue I'm still working through for field production. Next downside, crowding and creeping. The creeping of the grasses and clovers from the paths into the beds is kept pretty well under control because of the edger, but the creeping still does happen quite a bit, which means we either have to cultivate out any weeds that pop up or pull them by hand. Not a big deal, but also something you, you don't really face in other pathway management systems. I haven't come up with a great solution for grasses and plants that lay flat against the soil uh, and grow out over the beds. They're hard to mow and will go to seed quickly and quietly. Honestly, I need a mower that sort of pulls everything to the center as it mows. The edger does a good job of stopping some of that crowding and that creeping, but the creeping rhizomes do sometimes just sever off when you edge them and start new plants. So controlling that just requires more diligence and sometimes a little extra cultivation. Pests have not been an issue, in fact, I'm seeing fewer slugs than I've ever seen on our farm, but that may just be the new property and my decrease in compost usage and not the pathways. Um, slugs are also not a huge issue here, generally speaking. Um, more on the compost usage comment in a later video probably called something like, compost has gotten really expensive, now what? Or more likely, my static aerated compost system. So make sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss that one. Another equipment limitation, besides the fact that there are, is no equipment for our scale designed to manage pathways that both mows and edges at the same time in a single pass, which would be great, is power. The mower I have is a self-propelled 17-inch, 16-volt electric mower from Greenworks. And though it is surprisingly powerful for what it is, it does get bogged down when the grass is about six inches or taller uh, and thick. And I want the paths to be thick with plants um, in the same way that I want cover crops to be thick, uh, you know, to cover the area, to photosynthesize as much as possible. But also when you mow a tall grass, a lot of roots die back and that creates soil organic matter for the, you know, and nutrients for the plants in the beds to tap into and also better water penetration. But if, the, if it's too thick, the mower won't get them. The mower can't handle that. Or alternatively, I have to use a weed whacker, which works but tosses grass everywhere. So you can't really do that if there are lettuce or you know other greens in the beds. And unfortunately, or fortunately, if you're a customer of ours right now, there are a lot of greens and lettuces in the beds right now, um, being the beginning of May. Anyway, yeah, equipment is a limitation always in this system. In fact, if I could go back in time, I would simply make the paths the width of my flail mower instead of buying that a tool that just does that singular job. The advantage of the lighter mower though, is that I can easily pick it up and move it. Um, so I don't hate that, but it does feel sometimes like I'm using tools built for managing a couple hundred square feet of lawn for farm work. Oh, that's literally what I'm doing, yeah. Something else uh, about these is that I think I need to incorporate at least one good winter grass with the clovers and such, uh, because they do go a little dormant, dormant over the winter, which leads to some bald spots in the spring. Perhaps next time I tarp a full area that already has living pathways, I can establish some perennial rye perhaps uh, with my white and red clovers to make up for that. I also need a good summer grass to kind of do the same thing in the summer. Perhaps, I don't know, like teff or something, because my late, by late summer, I've worn everything out by, well, over mowing. It's nice because the paths stop growing in September, uh, so the management disappears, but it's also unfortunate because the, that lack of growth, I think, further contributes 
to the bald spots, while also at the same time sort of decreasing photosynthesis, you know, the, which is what I'm seeking by keeping living pathways to begin with. Otherwise, the living pathways are still my favorite thing on the farm, by far. If perennial cover crops are the sort of holy grail of farming for soil health, I believe that living pathways are the closest thing we will likely ever see to that on a commercial scale. Because by and large, I've found that they are practical and not that super hard to manage and are just pure photosynthesis. That is, if we can figure out the little kinks and the proper equipment and management strategies for each context. So indeed, there are downsides, but nothing we can't work around. Last thing, real quick, as I've mentioned elsewhere, I tried to establish some paths in chamomile last fall, and it sort of worked. The goal here was to see if I could find a crop that would effectively never need a mowing. And so I tried some Roman chamomile. I was surprised at how well the chamomile established after being sown in the fall. Um, and it looked like it was going to really fill in the space which it kind of has, but then other weeds have crept in and the spring vetch being fetch uh, has kind of taken some amount of residency. As I kill these cover crops, we will get to see more and more how the chamomile has hold, held up. Um, but I have to say, it is the most pleasant thing to walk through with the smell of fresh chamomile wafting up. This fall, I'm going to sow chamomile in every pathway. So there is at least some, no matter what part of the farm I'm working on because it is amazing. More on that later as the season goes on, but if it works, then I theoretically have a path that takes little or no management, or at very least becomes a soothing presence in the garden that kind of smells like botanical bubble gum. Anyway, that's it. Feel free to let me know your thoughts on living pathways, especially if you have experience managing them. Um, what have been your challenges? Like this video if you like this video make sure to subscribe to the channel um, and if you want to support this work you can support it at patreon.com slash no till growers pick up a copy of my book i do talk about living pathways in there the living soil handbook if you buy it from notillgrowers.com the proceeds from that sale go to making more stuff like this um, also this video was paid for in part by a grant from southern sayer otherwise thanks for watching we'll see you next week bye